Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, we're going to take a look at CloudInit. CloudInit is awesome. And unfortunately, in my opinion, it doesn't really seem to get the love or attention that it deserves. And that's a shame because it's very useful. A good use case for CloudInit is when you want to create your very own Linux deployment images. And there might be a few things that you want to automatically handle every time you deploy a new Linux server from that image. Things like ensuring a default user is created, your SSH host keys are regenerated, and there's all kinds of things that you can do with CloudInit, and we're going to take a look at some of those things in this very video. Now, before we get into that, I want to take a moment to mention the sponsor for today's video, Linode. Linode has been doing cloud computing since 2003, which is actually before Amazon Web Services was even a thing. On Linode's platform, you can get your server up and running in minutes. And they include all of the popular distributions such as Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, and get this, even Arch Linux. And let's be honest, what could be better than a Linux-focused cloud server provider that allows you to tell all your friends, I run Arch? Linode has multiple server plans available to make any app scalable and flexible. You can use it to host a blog, a VPN server, a Minecraft server, and much more. In fact, Linode is the chosen platform that's used to host the entire web presence of Learn Linux TV. And Linode offers 24 by 7 365 support, regardless of plan size, so you can get live help from a real person when you need it. New users can get started right now with $100 in credit towards a new account, and I highly recommend you check them out because Linode is awesome. Thank you so much to Linode for their continued sponsorship of Learn Linux TV. I really appreciate it. Now, let's go ahead and dive into CloudInit. On the screen right now, I'm connected to my Linode server that I'm going to use as the example server for today's video. Now, it really doesn't matter which server platform or provider you are using. This will even work on a physical server, for example. But what I'm going to be doing is using Ubuntu as the reference distribution. And most of what I'm going to go over should apply to other distributions as well. You might have to adjust some commands accordingly to fit other distributions if you're not running Ubuntu. But if you're running Debian, that's probably even better because virtually everything should carry over to Debian since that's the parent distribution of Ubuntu anyway. So let's go ahead and dive in. Now, the first thing that you should do is find out whether or not CloudInit is already installed on your server. Some server providers provide CloudInit as part of their default image. Some don't. At the end of the day, it just depends on where you received your server from. Could have been a manual installation of Ubuntu server. Maybe you received your instance from a cloud server provider such as Linode, or maybe you're running it in VirtualBox. Regardless, we can run the following command to see whether or not CloudInit is installed on our server. So I'm going to run dpkg dash dash git dash selections, and I'm going to grep for cloud in it. And in my case, it is already installed. You can see it in the first line right there. If cloud in it is not already installed in your server, then you can install it with the following command. Now, normally I would tell you to run sudo before any command that's going to make changes to your server. I'm logged in as root. I don't actually need sudo for anything. If you're logged in as a local user account or a non-root user account, then you will need to use sudo. I'm going to omit that. But what I want to do right now is run apt update. And that'll help me make sure that my package repository index is fully up to date. I'll press enter. And there we go. Next, if you don't already have CloudInit installed on your server, then you can install it with apt install and then cloud hyphen init. Just keep in mind, like I mentioned, if you are not running under root, you will need to use sudo. That's the last time I'll mention it. On my end, even though I already have cloud init installed on my server, it was already installed in the image provided to me by Linode, what I wanna do is actually remove it and completely purge it so I can start from scratch. So to do that, I'm going to run apt remove dash dash purge cloud hyphen init. And again, you should only have to do this if CloudInit was already installed on your server. That's going to completely wipe it out for me.
And then next I could run apt install cloud hyphen init, and that'll give me a fresh copy of cloud init. That should run pretty quickly. And that's it. So what I'm going to do now is change my directory into the Etsy cloud directory. And inside there, if I list the storage, you can see I have some configuration files already there. And the file that we want to pay special attention to is the first one here, cloud.cfg. That's the file that we're going to be working with. Let's make a backup copy of it just to be safe. So I'm just going to make a copy of it and append dot back to the end of the copied file. Simple enough. Next, what I'm going to do is open that file in an editor. I'll use Nano, at least for the purposes of this tutorial. Normally, I use Vim. Nano is just easier to explain in a tutorial video. So if you want to use a different editor, go right ahead. And some tutorials will actually start you off with a blank cloud config file. And while that's probably okay, I don't like to do it that way. I like to start with the distribution supplied version of the cloud.cfg file because there might be distribution specific customizations in there that we might want to take advantage of. Now there's several things that I'm going to do in this file. I'm going to make various changes and I'll explain to you exactly what I'm doing. Now what I recommend is that in a browser, and I already have it open, that you pull up this page right here. I will have this linked in the description down below. This is a list of modules for Cloudinit. And no, I'm not creating a video just to basically tell you RTFM, but the reason why I'm pointing you to this particular web page is because in the config file that we have in front of us in the terminal, there might be a line in there that you're just curious what it does. And pretty much everything in that file that's there by default will have a listing here that you could read that'll let you know what that particular module does. If nothing else, it's good just to bookmark this page in case you might need it later. Anyway, what I'm going to do right now is remove a few sections. So basically what I do is I scroll through the list and if anything doesn't apply to me, I get rid of it. Now you want to be careful. If you don't really understand what something does, then you may as well just leave it alone. In my case, there are definitely some things here that I know for sure I will never need. So what I'm going to do is remove those things. For example, this line right here, Biobu, that's not an application that I actually use. So I'm going to get rid of that line. Scrolling down, we have some more things here. I'm not personally using Puppet. I don't use Chef. M Collective, I think is part of Puppet. Either way, I don't use it. And I don't use Salt either. So if there's anything here that you know for sure that you're not going to use, you can go ahead and remove it. Now, back at the top of the file, just going to keep going up here. We're going to customize this section right here. What this line is instructing Cloudinit to do is create a default user. Every distribution is going to have its own default user. For example, on Debian, the default user is going to be Debian. On Ubuntu, the default user is Ubuntu. Now, personally, I don't like having a user named Ubuntu on my systems, so what I like to do is comment this out. Now, what you're supposed to be able to do is rename the default user to whatever you want it to be. I've tried it, and anytime I do that, it completely bricks the install and I can't get in. I have no idea why, it is what it is, so what I do instead is just comment out this line. And then if you scroll down, there's going to be a section that's dedicated to the creation of the default user. It's quite a ways down. And it starts right here. We have default user. And this is where you could change the name of that default user. In the case of Ubuntu, like you see here, it's called Ubuntu. Again, I've tried changing it. It makes everything fail. And I don't want to be locked out. So what I'm going to do is comment out every single line in this section. That's going to make sure that the default user is disabled. Now we're going to scroll all the way back up here. And just remember this user section right here, we need to come back to that. I'm going to save the file and exit for now, but make sure you do not reboot your server though. There's actually some additional customizations we need to make to this file, but what I need to do right now is create a password hash for my user. So I'm going to save the file and exit it's Control-O and then Enter in the case of Nano to save the file. 
and then control X to exit out. Next, we're going to need access to the mkpasswd command. In my case, as you can see here, I do have access to that command. If you don't, at least in the case of Ubuntu and Debian, then you can install the whois package to get access to that command. So I just did a search for that package, and the last item here, whois in green, a few lines from the bottom, that's the package I was referring to, it's already installed. So we do have access to it, and that's good. Next, what we can do is use the mkpasswd command to create a password hash for the user that we're about to create. So we type mkpasswd-m, and then sha-512, just like that. It's going to ask for a password, but it's not asking for the user's password or the password of the user that we're logged in as right now. What we should type instead is the password that we want the new user to have. So I'm going to type that in right now. And as you see here, we have a password hash. So we're going to copy that. And then we're going to return to the file that we were editing. So back in the user section, we can add a new section for the user that we want to create, and I'm going to create that right now. So right here, I'm going to type hyphen and then name, colon, and then the name of the user that I want to create. On the next line, I'm going to line up the cursor underneath the N, and then I'm going to type lock underscore passwd. I'm going to set that to false, and that means we don't want to lock the password for this particular user. And then on the next line, we'll type passwd and then colon. And then right here, we'll paste the password hash that we grabbed from the previous command. And there it is. And it wrapped a little bit, but you get the idea. You won't be copying that particular password hash. You'll just use whatever one came up when you ran the mkpasswd command for yourself. So the fact that that's wrapped shouldn't really matter. And then here, we're going to type geckos with a colon. And that's where you could type your user's name. Not the username, but the actual name of the user. So you could type your first and last name here if you wanted to. I just put my first name. That's good enough for me. Now there's some additional lines that I want to create here, but I'm just going to paste them in. It's probably better than watching me type and make a bunch of typos anyway. So I'm going to paste right here the remaining lines for this section. For the SSH authorized keys line, what we could do right here is add an SSH key if we have one. And having an SSH key is highly recommended. So if you don't have an SSH key, I highly recommend that you create one. It's beyond the scope of this video. I do have other videos on my channel that will describe the entire process. So if you don't have a key and you don't plan on using one, you could delete this line as well as the one underneath it. Now for groups, you want to pay special attention to this one because you may not have the same groups on your system as I have on mine. And if I scroll all the way to the right, you see that the line wraps a bit. We have some remaining groups here. So just make sure that each of these groups exist on your system before you add them. Don't just copy and paste this because I'm not really sure what would happen if you copy and paste groups that you don't actually have on your system. Just cross-reference the groups that you have on your system along with the groups that I have here. When it comes to sudo on some distributions, that could be called wheel, for example. So just make sure of that and I'll leave it up to you to make sure that you have the proper groups. I will have a link in the description below that'll point to the wiki article for this video, so you could copy and paste all the commands that I'm using here. Again, just make sure that the groups you see on this list actually exist on your end, and if it doesn't, just don't include it in this list in the config file. Right here we have a line of config for sudo, and that's just going to set the sudo options for the user that we're creating. And then finally, we're setting the shell for the user, in this case, slash bin slash bash. So now there's a few more lines of configuration that I'm going to walk you through. The next thing that we're going to search for is time zone. It should already be in the file. I think it's a bit down here. Here it is. Now what you can do is actually add your time zone right here. If you know what it is, go ahead and add it. I will have a link in the description below that'll point to a list of time zones that you can add if you're curious. In my case, America slash Detroit, 
That's close enough. Now at the end of the file, and I mean the very end of the file, we're going to add an entirely new section. I'm going to paste it in, and here it is. The boot command option allows us to run a command at first boot. In this case, I'm running the date command, and I'm sending the output to the birth certificate file in the Etsy directory. This is a little silly, but I find it fun. What this means is that if you create an image, and you have a config file, a cloud init config file with this command in there, then the first time you create a new server from that image with this cloud init configuration, it's going to basically put its own birth date in this config file. So if you're curious when this server came online for the first time, you can find the date right here in this file. Again, it's kind of silly, but a little fun. Now perhaps more useful is the fact that we could tell CloudInit to make sure that several packages are installed by default. So I'm going to paste it in right here, and there we go. So in my case, I'm having it install Git, Tmux, and Vim. And this is a very specific version of Vim, the one that I like to use, that has some extended support for scripting languages. This isn't required, just a fun thing to add here. If you have some packages on your end that you want every server to have, you may as well add them here. Now what I'm going to do now is save the file, Control O and then Enter, and then Control X. Next, what we're going to do is change directory yet again. And inside the directory that we're already in is a subdirectory called cloud.cfg.d. And inside there, we're going to create a special file. And this is the name right here, 99-fake underscore cloud.cfg. Most likely this file will not exist by default, so I'm going to paste the contents into this file, and then I'll give you a little bit of information as far as what it's doing. And here it is. So the reason why we're creating this particular config file is because normally CloudInit needs a data source. And the data source is often a web server that it's able to connect to that contains some values that it'll use for its configuration. And on some cloud providers, such as AWS and others, there's actually a dedicated URL that it can use to connect and retrieve that data. Now in my case, at least when it comes to Linode, there's no actual web server that's exposed that provides information to CloudInit. Now one option is that you can create a web server that'll provide that information, and that's beyond the scope of this video, but with the no cloud option, even though this is a cloud provider, we're just kind of taking the easy way out and just bypassing that system altogether. And that's all this is doing. So I'll save it, control O and then enter, and then control X. Go back to the other directory. Now hopefully when I created the cloud.cfg file, I didn't have any typos, but one command that you might want to run before you run anything else is cloud hyphen init, and then clean. This is especially useful if CloudInit has already run on your server, in which case it's probably not going to run when you reboot. So essentially, this resets CloudInit. And actually, there's one more thing that I want to add to the cloud.cfg file, and I forgot to mention this earlier, so we're going to bring that back up. And then we're going to scroll down. And we're looking for this line right here, preserve hostname. And what I'm going to do is paste a few more lines right here. So I added these two lines, and the first line right here, hostname, as you might suspect, is giving us the option to set the hostname that we want for the server. Right above it, we have preserve hostname false. If yours also says false, we want to leave that alone. If we set that to true, it's going to preserve the current hostname, not actually use the one that we want to set it to that we're setting here in the line down below. And then you can simply change this host name to whatever you want it to be. Then the third line here, what that's going to do is update the Etsy host file to ensure that it also references the correct host name as well. And that's important because we want that to be consistent. So I'm going to save the file again, control O and then enter, and control X to exit out. Now, before we go any further, there's a little bit of errata to go through first. There's a file in the Etsy systemd directory that pertains to networking, and when that file exists, it prevents CloudInit from working, so we'll need to remove it. And it's actually this one right here. It's a symbolic link named 99-default.link, and I did some Googling, and from what I understand, someone else had some luck getting this to work by just removing that file, so let's just get rid of it.
Now, just to make sure that everything is clean, I want to run cloud hyphen init and then clean one more time. And then now we should actually be able to run cloud init. If nothing else, this will help us test that the config file is correct. Normally what you would do is shut down the server and take an image of it. So that way the next time it comes up, it's going to apply all the configurations. But before we do that, we want to make sure that the cloud.cfg file is correct. So let's go ahead and run it. We're going to run cloud hyphen init init, just like this. Moment of truth, let's see what happens. And that's it. You can see how quickly that ran. And we can see some changes were already made. For example, the host name is set. My host name was what I put in the configuration file. Also, right here, we actually have the host name represented in the Etsy host file as well. That's pretty cool. And then right here, we have the birth certificate file. And inside there is the date that this server would have been created if it was actually being created. This was just a test. So if this was a new server deployment, this would actually be the quote unquote birth date of the server. But what you're seeing right here is that it's actually working and that's pretty cool. So there you go. We have successfully set up cloud in it and we created a custom config file for it. So that way we can create a custom server deployment image that'll automatically set up a few things for us to make our jobs a little bit easier every time we set up a new server. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. I really appreciate you guys checking this out, liking this video and subscribing to the channel. And I'll see you again very soon. Thanks for watching.